Hey, everybody, we're taking a look today at Walter Simonson's work on the aliens adaptation. And uh, Carson, you're working a little larger than I am here. Um, what size are you at right now? Maybe I have an 11 by 14. I just I just took the size of the <clears throat> book, which was supposedly the size of the art. So I, right. it was it looked like it was about 12, 12 and a half inches wide. So I just took this page and printed this out at 12 inches wide by whatever the you know whatever the size that was left yeah. over because we're not doing the whole page i just picked a piece of it so i'm working at slight reduction here uh from that and uh he has got a fantastic ink line yeah what what are you using you're using your 101 no so today i've i've uh i've decided to retire my 101 for a while oh, um wow. i'm I'm going back to um, the Estherbrook 356, which is um, the uh, nib preferred by Carl Burks, which is unfortunate because everybody knows that that's Carl Burks's nib. And so it costs more than it should. Oh, shit. <laughs> so you can get all these other um, Estherbrook nibs from the same time period for almost nothing. And these have all of a sudden become expensive. So I got a little yeah. anxious about them. You're buying new old stock. Yeah, and I was anxious I was going to run out. And then it's like, you know what, dude? I got to just use them. Because, like, I don't want to not use them because I, I'm afraid they're going to run out. How does that make sense, you know? Yeah, like, why are you going to have a tool that you're not going to use? Like, I don't, I'm using, okay, I got the 102. And then I don't know what this is, but I feel like he's probably working with a bigger pen than the 102 because some of his lines get pretty chunky. Yeah, no, I don't think it's a 102. I think that he's got something like similar to the Esterbrook and that it's um <clears throat> flexible but not uh not not so rigid um and not like encouraging the fine line. I always thought that he had a really nice uh active line. And uh, yeah, he you know, it's actually what's about too much. No. It's actually easier to see his his active line in his uh, more minimal work with all the rendering that he does on this, it's a lot harder. There's more noodling, you know? Yeah. Um, um, man, I can't believe I've missed out on Paul Pope, the only lefty so far. This is a righty right here. Yeah, as soon as Matt said that, or as soon as the one of our subs commented on that, I thought that was hilarious. Because me and Matt were actually talking about that too. I believe Matt's a lefty as well. Okay. Uh, so I, I was asking Matt, I was telling him like that you always comment on that. And I said, as a lefty, does this feel weird to you? And he what he wasn't like as tuned into it as you are. Hmm. So he was like, mm, I don't know. Or maybe it just felt comfortable enough that it was like, well, this is fine. I don't, I'm not having a problem with it. Well, Matt is also a very devil may care in his inking. Yeah, envious of that. He seems uh, like a, you know, he makes me look like the pinnacle of restraint. <laughs> you know? Well, and as I don't want to say I'm the pinnacle of restraint, but as an extremely restrained artist, <laughs> you know, it's like, oh my God, how do you? Like, how do you ink? What is he He's doing? Like, I don't know. He did like seven pages in a day or something. Yeah, yeah. it's insane, huh? Yeah. yeah. So um, Matt Battaglia, who joined Carson uh, for the Paul Pope uh, one and, uh, and uh, joined us for a, a discussion on Paul Pope, I should go ahead and say, I think it's safe to say uh, he's doing a book for Living the Line. Woo! I've seen I'm super, super excited about it. I've seen the uh, I've seen the layouts for it, and I've seen him banging out the inks like crazy, and it's really beautiful stuff. I asked him to time it because uh, he told me that he could do a page in an hour, and I didn't believe him. <laughs> and then he wound and, up doing uh, it in like forty five minutes, right? That, that's right. Yeah, son of a bitch. <laughs> um so so simonson man i gotta warm up this is it, he's faster he's faster than me much yeah, faster he's, 
he's pretty fast and i'm going to try and work fast and less um less like exacting and more in the spirit of on this one for sure i gotta flip it i gotta flip it upside down <laughs> it's so that too... i can achieve the the proper speed um because i i am getting i'm not i'm not warmed up yeah so okay i'm instantly having better results being upside down because you need to be um, able to flick your pin in in the opposite direction of what he's doing exactly um so those of you guys who've watched a few of these, this is a recurring theme with us. You can tell the speed at which someone is making a, a mark with a tool if that tool is a responsive tool. In other words, because uh, he's inked most of this with a nib, you can see with his lines the speed that he was moving. And he can't imitate that with a mark that is slower, significantly slower than the mark that he's made. Real pain Fair in the say? butt. <laughs> yeah, it's a real pain in the butt if you're trying to mimic somebody, or or especially like, I mean, there's there's very limited instances in comics where you would need to recreate someone else's work. But I got stuck into that in Strange Death of Alex Raymond, which I think is one of the reasons we do a lot of these, is because we've both been kind of down that hole of trying to reproduce not just the look of someone else's art, but actual pieces um and some of the more wild artists were definitely like man you can't you just can't do this you can't trace it like because the, the, they're too wild and this is definitely one of those one of those artists uh one yeah, another we're... reason that i would use a bigger pin is with i can go like this with this pin which he's obviously doing mm -hmm. he's doing a lot of that back and forth stuff i got most of the main line so i'm going to flip it back now so i can assess a little more and be a little bit more intentional about it it was just frustrating for me to have those main lines obviously be wrong when i'm doing them left-handed it's a little yours is catching a lot of light because you're tilting it away from your camera it's a little hard to see sorry about that uh okay you're you're kind of doing what i'm doing i'm and i'm always you're always better about capturing like the process I'm trying to stick yeah. a little bit more to like what I think his process was, which is what you're doing. I think establish the basic contours mm -hmm. and then noodle the, the hatching and the texture. Yeah. And you can see that some of the hatching is done while he's doing the contour, uh, especially these sort of side marks. You know, you can tell he came in and was like, oh, okay, look, there's some right there. But then a lot of the rest of it seemed like it might be more of a, come back in afterwards kind of thing yeah it's a little hard to tell which is which but there are certain ones that definitely feel to me like i gotta do it now so people watching along you'll see which ones we go oh i guess i gotta do that now and, um yeah this is i have a really hard time with wild artists like this because I just, I'm, I draw to, I don't think I draw terribly slow, but it's, it's more deliberate usually. What do you, what do you think about when he came in with the brush? I would say probably the contours first, then the brush, but that's just because I tend to think mm -hmm. that way. But again, I, I tend to a... work with the brush and that lets me that lets me move from a contour to a big shadow to super fine detail all like I can just stay in the same area and just move back and forth at will with with the pen, especially the larger pen like this that um, the ink marks stay wet for longer. So you either right. have to have your hand off the paper or you got to work a little more intentionally. So, like for you, you would have to work right to left, I assume. Mm -hmm. So I tend to think that people that work like that probably are a little bit more like making passes. I'm going to work from here to here right. and then let it dry and come back over. Like stages. Yeah. So I would assume that the next stage is get the brush and then do all the fine hatching. I don't know. What's your... 
Yeah, that's that's exactly my thought. And then I think that the last stage, you see these, I, I don't know, I, I don't see a lot of the hatching that was done with the brush, but at least the ones on the head look like they were, or they might have been anyway. This right here? Yeah. Whoa, I went too far there. That looks like pen to me. Okay. That's this. Oops, I'm not having, oh my God, I'm ruining it. But I think he just went, he's just got better control over where he stops. That's what this looks like to me. Okay. I'm going too long. Because I'm trying to get the speed of it. There we go. Those look like brush to me, but, or sorry, pen. He obviously has more control than I do, though. Or if, <laughs> you know, he drew it, so it stopped wherever his hand stopped. I didn't right. draw it, so I'm not stopping where his hand. Not that my line was bad. It just doesn't match his. Uh, better at keeping the same direction than I was, too. But again, I'm, uh, neither of us are particularly at all warmed up. I'm get, oh. getting more warmed up as we're going here. Yeah. Um. The the uh, advantage to the Esterbrook 356 that I'm using right now, Carson, is uh, it the, the thing about the 101 is it's it's closer to inking uh, with the brush. It's you know like ice skating, like any minor amount of variation gives you a huge amount uh, of pressure gives you a huge amount of variation in your line. Whereas the 356 that I'm using right now um, is a lot less like that. So I can put a lot, you know, some pressure and get a lot of variation. It's, yeah, it's, I don't, it's, sorry, go ahead. It's a little bit less, it's, it's a little more to, easier to control. I don't like brush or uh, pins that have a brushy, aspect to them i like my pins to be a little more stiff and predictable and right. and the brushes then i you know i don't know the the feeling of a pin just gives me a feeling of solidity and when it, it doesn't respond right. that way it freaks me out a little bit yeah so like the the 104 the 102 is the classic stiff one i mean that's just as stiff as you can get um and this is somewhere between those two extremes Whatever I'm using, I have no idea what this nib is, but uh, it's it's bigger, but it it's more uh, it's also stiff, a little bit stiffer. So it's letting me have some good variation, but it's not that total brushy. Right. Another thing that makes me think he came in and did a lot of this hatching later is he's got these little lines here that define where the shadow is going to be, right. but. Then yep. it comes back in like later, it looks like. I love these. You're exactly right. And he's even got some hatching, some hatching uh, right on top of some of those lines too, not just up to it. Yeah. Same thing with the teeth. You see like he's outlined the teeth for the most part, but then you've got a few like hatching marks on the top of them to like push a few of them back and to give yeah. you some grotesque gum. But I do think maybe some of like this rib stuff coming around the head there that was put in while he was doing the contour because it creates a more right. broken contour. That makes sense to me. Uh, like this right here seems maybe like he just went back and forth while he was putting in the contours and then cleaned it up. But I could be wrong. I could see it either way. You think that uh, somebody like Walter Simonson has been disadvantaged by not having like a you know graphic novel or something that he put together or do you think that he's you know big enough and legendary enough that he has kind of transcended the genre uh, genre fiction thing he's pretty well regarded and well well respected i mean there's a reason like our patrons were asking to see this you know yeah you know, i mean i think it's fantastic i'm just i'm just wondering if it's like you know how much that dichotomy matters you know for me it's like if you can't buy a book of it i don't want to have a bunch of comics around all the time you know um, yeah but i think his stuff has been collected in enough like like marvel has like the walter simonson thor omnibus type of thing oh, okay. like the 
I don't know. I, those things are like constantly, those legendary runs are constantly in print. I don't know about stuff like you're talking about a lawnmower man and all that kind of stuff. I don't, I don't know. I'm not, I'm more familiar with his, him being like the legendary Thor artist, you know, a um, gotcha. little bit before my time. I know he did, he did some stuff for like Wildstorm and a lot of the image guys, because obviously they looked up to him. Uh, so right. they were getting people like Barry Windsor Smith and Walter Simonson to do Wildcats and shit. Uh, <laughs> Well, that's interesting. I think he did a cyber force or something. Huh. Well, you can see like Dan, the Dan Green Silverstri team really picked a lot from him. Yeah, they all obviously love. I th actually, I think he did a storm watch. I don't know. He did something for one of the image guys. I remember because I remember seeing it as a kid and it was a little bit too rough for me. It wasn't because I was, you know, for a long time, I was kind yeah. of a knucklehead. It was like a pretty purish, like Jim Lee fan. And it was it was too, too unhinged and uncontrolled for my knucklehead young taste. I, I feel like Dan Green, who I, I think is, you know, one of the great underrated superhero inkers. Um, I think Dan Green must have studied things like this. When I'm yeah, he was hatch. someone I'm not terribly familiar with. You know, it was always like, you got to have Scott Williamson, like he's the dude. Uh, so, there, and I think, I think you were a little bit more exposed to stuff. Like I got involved with anything other than Ninja Turtles. I wasn't aware of it until Jim Lee's X-Men number one. So like all of that stuff was happening in the couple years prior correct like Silvestri's mm -hmm. yeah yep. so that wasn't a part of my comics upbringing yeah Dan Green um inked he was like the x-men the uncanny x-men uh inker extraordinaire that made you know Mark Silvestri issues right up against uh John Romita Jr issues make sense visually because they had the continuity of being finished by the same guy, you know? Yeah. Um, and I remember mm -hmm. seeing some of those, like, John Romita, X-Men, and I had an issue of the Silvestri ones that had Sabretooth and Wolverine, like, fighting in a sewer, Yeah, if I yep. remember correct. But to me, they were all too... They looked like old comics to me. <laughs> right. Like, compared to the Jim Lee stuff. So that's what I thought of, is this is, like, old guys... But now, yeah, I look back and I think, wow, that shit's great. I, I just wonder if, uh, you know, he picked up from that some of these hatching techniques. Uh, I could always tell a Simonson cover, even when I was a young kid, by the looseness of the lines and some of the, you know, like the backstrokes here. That's very much him. It's not a really common, you know. It's I like just, back and forth thing. Those. Yeah, exactly yeah and uh it's very and also strange he, does, he also does this sort of flat like approach line where he'll like stop at an angle and sort of dip the pen or uh plant the pen and it gives it that little squared off little thing yeah i'm trying to figure out how to do that i think he's like starting that way mm -hmm. or, like or down stops. down here in these like that's right thick, and then I've yep. never really been good at that, Mark. I think it's. Well, like I'm gonna that. have to do him upside down. <laughs> but yeah, he's 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 starting. You get a little squared off thing and then going. But I mean, he's obviously doing it much faster than I'm accomplishing there, because you know, that's his ticky mark. Yeah, he. That's just what his hand does. So you can train yourself to do it, but you're not going to get convincing ones right off the bat. See, some of that to me, I, like way more easily accomplished with brush. So that's where I'm like, okay, well, that's he's working with brush there because he also has no these big way. brushy marks. But I, you know, yeah. I it's obviously he probably has a really natural. He doesn't even think about it. Thing that he does with the pen that gets that 
Whereas I have a more natural thing to get that with the brush, but with the pen, I really have to think my way through it. Right. If I copied Simonson for like, you know, 10 pages worth, then I could make it a natural mark for me, which is one of the things I like about doing these recreations. Uh, someone was kind of giving us crap for the topi one, you know, that's, oh, you're just soulless tracing over. It's like, well, yeah, that's what we're doing, but there is kind yeah. of a slower, more intentional, thoughtful approach that we're taking trying to and the guy was totally right i mean especially stuff yeah. like simonson and and sergio topi like like you said you can't go slow you lose what's great about it but in the yeah. slow intentional mark making i'm trying to like learn what how, how did the guy hold his hand what did he do with it and I, to me that's really fun because then it can become an instinctive part of my vocabulary right that i can access from time to time yeah, uh, somebody who, who has an issue with this, I mean, all I would say is that this is a time-honored, very long technique that has been around forever uh, when, you know, if you were uh, a young up-and-coming painter in the Italian Renaissance, you didn't go have an exhibition. You went and you worked with a painter who made you copy his own stuff. Yeah. And copy models around the studio and learn how to paint like him so that you could then one day paint like you. Yeah. Uh, we, and we hopefully don't think that, surpass the master. Right, which obviously neither of us is going to do when it comes to somebody like uh, Walter Simonson. Uh, my apologies, Carson. Uh, <laughs> I'll get there. <laughs> no. No. Um, and part of that is because neither of us is going to draw a monthly comic for 30 years. Yeah, that's the um, prohibitive thing is um, you got to respect the people that do this all day, every day, because it becomes so fluid. And you can't get that just by checking in, you know, maybe on the weekends, maybe if you're lucky after your full time teaching job. Right. Like, I mean, I think about that looks at Alex Raymond all the time, you know, like I could, I could never get to that level because that guy did a, a strip right. for his whole life. That's, I mean, it's a crazy amount of drawing. Um, I'm going to grab a brush here pretty quick. Yeah, I'm getting pretty close to the brush stage too. But it's just, there's so many fun little textures, <laughs> so yeah. many fun little marks. It's kind of hard to... Like, uh, I want to keep going. I'm trying to keep it at realistically at the same pacing as what he would have done. <clears throat> yeah, I'm trying to be pretty fast, which is abnormal for me that I'm kind of at the same speed as you. Mm -hmm. I think we've put down about the same amount of ink. I think you're right. Uh, which is for anyone who's watched previous, there's a little dick right here. That's fun. His finger looks like a little dick. Uh, yeah, I'm trying to speed up. I'm going to, well, I'm going to real quick just do a contour on the guy because there's some really Simonson lines in there. And I think he's yeah, doing a can't. lot more. There's there's a lot more in the face. There's a lot more like he's just, he's not even lifting the pin up. He's just going all like one continuous line, it looks like on the face. Mm -hmm. And that's part of his distinctive look too you know where this hand ended up what do you mean eric larson oh yeah absolutely and eric a lot of the mark making too yeah but you know with a jumbo marker or whatever and a, have you seen his grip no he has the strangest grip on his drawing implement that you've ever seen like how it's something like this like hmm. oh or no there's another guy named okay? Brad moore who holds his pen like this he grabs it here and like huh. dr draws like a printer machine eric Lar no eric larson is he, he draws like this i think yeah okay. he go he goes like this i'm gonna try it and then you you can see him he like 
he rotates hmm. like around it's very strange I, I i saw it at a convention once and then have since watched you know pulled up videos every now and then of it just because it's fun to watch so part of the reason he's getting such big lines is because his hand is down so he can pull these triangles and simonson might be doing that he he actually might not be using a brush he might have his pin on the side like this and then some of that back and forth might be like that okay that would make sense with these bigger triangular marks that i'm having a hard time getting to that it's like this yeah, that makes way more sense to me. Hmm. There we go. Oh yeah. There we go. So nice some call. of the stuff that I that I might instinctively think is brush might just be him. Well, surely he's not this... doing all sorry, go ahead. Surely he's not doing all of this black with with the side to side scrub stroke you think he is no huh? i don't think so but some of these like rectangular marks might, might not be a brush he might be treating this right. like a drawing pencil you know right like because a lot of people when they draw they hold it more sideways oh i see what you're saying okay the mystery rectangles yeah yeah um but it yeah it's possible that he's coming through and like or it's a little blobby blob yeah you know something like this let's square it off little blobby blob but it doesn't look like something that he's come back and like then like okay i'm gonna go and perfect the little triangle no. on it he doesn't strike me as someone who's gonna come back to that no that's the mark he made, and that's what he's got. Yeah, for sure. I'm way too American, so I hold my pen up and down. Okay, that's enough of that. Uh, I'm going to go in with the brush now. Yeah, good call. Um, have you done the head rendering? Yeah, I figured that the head rendering is probably the last thing. This right here. I just did some mm -hmm. of it because we were talking about it. No, I, I did the one on the very side. I didn't do the top one. Oh, saying. up here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and and really, I think even some of the line work could even be brush, you know. Like when he's in there with the brush filling in the blacks, there's no reason why you wouldn't go put a couple right. big chunky brush stroke marks or come out and even do like a... But again, I'm way more comfortable with the brush, so... Right. A lot of these marks feel more natural to me with the brush, even though I know they're made with the pen. Which is a weird thing. It's like when I do the, when I have recreated uh, the image, and this is another reason I know this isn't the, the 102, uh, because he has that really back and forth scribbly style. Yeah. That you can't get with the, the 102. But when I've recreated, 102 art i'll do it with the brush because it's easier for me to get that really crisp snap line that they get with this than right. with the 102 it's always impressive to me kind of how clean some people can be with the nibs yeah it's definitely a mental state i think it, some of it can be the sort of monomania thing if you're not careful get obsessed with like the perfect line instead of thinking about what's appropriate for what it is that you're drawing yeah being so, you know, like a lot of this stuff in the ribs to me like this makes sense with the brush i'm just going through and like hatching in because he's he's a lot of times like creating black with hatching which right. is part of the the style that's really nice it looks cool and it, it's it it gives it more form because mm -hmm. he's thinking very directionally you know he's not just scrubbing in in the black he's he's putting it in in a way that emphasizes the volume 
Um, but it's kind of like, I wonder if you really like JC Leindecker as well. I don't know JC Leindecker. The painter, the illustrator? No, I don't know him at all. Oh, God. Okay, we need to do a Sean Learns Illustrators lesson. Um, <laughs> JC Leindecker was Norman Rockwell's hero. Rockwell did uh... one less, like Rockwell quit working for the Saturday Evening Post one one cover shy of matching Leindecker's huh. number of covers produced. Like that's how much he respected him. But he, as oh, a painter, co constructed his images out of like these very, like, like imagine working like this, but in color. And he'll do right. an area, like a shadow area would be like, like this and then kind of filled in. Right. Um, and so I, I see some of that in here. Way more wild. Leindecker's more controlled, but you got to look up JC Leindecker. He's one of the all time great illustrators. And luckily, uh, a town very near where I grew up, Stockton, California, at the Hagen Museum, somehow got a hold of almost all of his exist existing artwork. He, he <laughs> wanted, he was like destroying it all, and his lover, like, kept a lot of it hmm. uh, and then donated it to this funky little you know I shouldn't say funky they have a lot of amazing stuff but a very small museum in Stockton California and they have a ton of original line deckers in it they're a hell of a thing to see um, also you should go up there because they have a um, Gibson oh they do yeah they have a Charles Dana Gibson and it's awesome. like in a drawer and you can just pull it out and like hover over oh, it jeez that's a big drawer yeah uh it's talking about guys that really just let loose with the yeah and the there's some well, gibson I, in here for sure there sure is i was gonna say the exact same thing um i am uh tempted to do a video on gibson some point but i'm, I'm a little bit hesitant to for several reasons that you're probably aware of um if you guys don't know charles dan gibson look up his stuff don't know why you would be hesitant to do i will tell you about it. gibson is he a Off controversial camera. oh no oh okay oh no pra practical considerations okay i was like what did he do i mean i know we have gibson girls <laughs> <laughs> uh yeah this is a lot of fun inking this with a brush Yeah, I could see what you're talking about, the the side to side. Also, um, the topi. Yeah. He's also he, my brush is dead. <laughs> he switch like, brushes. He took Topi's ferocity and like but his uh he doesn't go in as many wrong directions as Topi does. Like he has the wildness of Topi in terms of the speed of mark making, but he won't like cut convex when he's trying to go concave like Topi would. You know, that's I think that's the thing that Topi does that no one else can really pull off is like, yeah, he doesn't flatten it out. Yeah, like, bro, your lines are going in the wrong direction, but it still looks good. How did you do that? <laughs> uh, Simonson's a little more little more concerned with proper contour or cross contour marks or he just realized at some point no nah, just leave that to Sergio Tope because right. no one no one else is going to pull that off so not going to bother oh you got your brush out all right I had to abandon the other brush. I got I got lucky. Whichever one I pulled out today is like holding exactly the shape I want. Here's a little topi moment right here. Oh yeah. Yeah, the little cross. Yeah. They like weave, the weird little weave. The weave, right.
But I would actually not be surprised if more of this hatching was done with brush than people suspect. I don't know. I could be wrong. Well, certainly, like you were saying, in the black areas where he's filled in and then just used the brush as an extension of the fill-in to, to sort of give it a little bit more um, of a gradation. Yeah, my question is, when he's doing those gradations, is some of it in brush, and then he comes back and adds to it in pen, or does he just keep going in brush, or is it pen all the way in, and I'm just not good at getting that big, chunky mark with the pen? Yeah. Uh, like, some of these areas look like maybe he just scrubbed back and forth with the brush. It's hard to tell. Especially because people who get really good with these tools can pretty much get the same look out of both. Right. That always makes this kind of exercise a bit futile and a conundrum. Like I just saw, uh, <laughs> we spent all this time um, on that Blade of the Immortal recreation using chopsticks and stuff, which was my fault. Uh, and someone said, oh no, he just uses like microns. <laughs> And a and a pintail pen brush. Yeah, I saw that. Do you think that's possible? I, the maybe microns, he did. I don't know. It's just so maybe he did at some point. It doesn't seem plausible to me for some of the yeah, but like people stuff. wind up using stuff in weird ways that because of how the particular way they use it, it just winds up looking like something else. Right. Um you know, so that's it it always kind of that that kind of thing reminds me like okay i'm seeing one thing but god knows what they're actually doing right and that's the fun of it you know it's mm -hmm. like doing the paul pope and watching matt like be so fluid with it and then it's like okay well that just looks like an alex raymond knockoff inked paul pope on mine <laughs> right you know it's that character of how an artist uses a tool is so interesting. I um, don't know whether to blame the recreations what you've been doing or what, but uh, I've been experiencing something fairly odd recently when I'm working on my own illustration stuff, which I have been pushing pretty hard this past couple of weeks. And that is not being able to see my own images resolve. Um, I don't know. I want to blame our recreations. What do you mean by that? Like you're not able to see it come together? Yes. You're just seeing it as a set of lines? Yes. Um, and a set uh -huh. of possibilities. Um, Maybe we should quit doing this. <laughs> <laughs> do you know what I mean? Like the, you know, the stage when you're, when you're working something and you're like, okay, well, I could take it this direction or I could take it that direction. And you're seeing like the map of what it could be. Um, it's so not resolving much. past that point. Huh. Uh, and the only know. thing that's sorry, go ahead. The only thing that's helping is time, like setting it aside and or turning it in, and coming back to it a couple weeks later. I've always, well, because I don't have that mental vi inner vision which we've talked about. I have the eight mm -hmm. Fantasia. Um, I'm never working against trying to match what's in my head. So there's okay. never a disappointment there. And working with the photo reference, which is not always the case, but it's pretty clear when you're like, okay, got all the information. Um, right. Now learning to take a step back and assess it as like a design unit of composition is yeah. probably something I learned too late in life. You know, probably just working with Dave taught me that, like, okay, you, you've got all of the information that's accurate to the image, but like, right. does it, is it a good drawing? Uh, is that like the stage where you're having trouble? Yeah. Uh, well, it just, yeah, the, the, it's, it's the, it's where you have the phantasm of all the different possibilities lurking on the board and you haven't realized any of them yet. Normally there's a stage where I let go of the phantasm 
and just commit to what it is that I have. And then it kind of engage in some responsive drawing from that, where you're like, okay, here's the thing that I've got. I just accept this and I'm going to move on. Um, yeah. I'm like, now what makes it a good composition from here? Right. Exactly. With what I've got as the fixed point. Um, and I'm not getting that resolve right now. Are you still struggling against the phantasm or you're just yeah. not even having a phantasm? No, I'm, I'm struggling against the phantasm. I see all the possibilities are still there and they remain there. And so they're irritating. They're like right. an irritant where I can't be satisfied with the thing that I've created because I'm seeing the different possibilities that haven't happened instead. No, see, I don't have that at all because there's no phantasm. There's no right. possibility of a phantasm. Right. Um, it, you'd probably be really interested to know I had a kid log in to my class. It was like the first class, you know, a couple of weeks ago, beginning of the semester. And everyone else got what they needed and logged out. And he stuck around. And I said, Well, you know, what can I help you with? Do you have any more questions? And very embarrassedly start to like kind of stutter his way through a question and like um, started asking if the class was focused on observational realism. And I thought, well, he's, he's kind of worried that I'm going to make him draw realistic stuff and he wants to use his imagination. And I said, well, yeah, like, you know, why? And he said, well, I was really worried we were going to have to do observational stuff. And he, he said, I have this condition. And he started explaining aphantasia and he he used the mm. term aphantasia and i was like well buddy you're lucky like i also have that <laughs> and i know exactly what it is um and he is so fascinated by and ir irked by this condition that he has that, that i also have or i can't visualize things that he's done a shitload of research on it and was hmm. explaining the neural mechanism of it to me um interesting it's it's has to do with something a protein process called mTOR and okay. the mTOR can be either upregulated or downregulated and if i forget which way but one way it it uh it what it does is it helps clip the dendrites in your neurons and i guess dendrites are responsible for local neuronal connections right and uh so it's it it's the mTOR process, whatever it is, helps clip the dendrites and so okay. they don't overgrow. So if it's I think if it's down regulated, the dendrites don't get clipped enough and they get too locally dense and that prohibits connection between a local area and longer longer neuronal connections to other part of the brain. And so you would get aphantasia because like my visual processing isn't talking to my prefrontal cortex, but you can hmm. also get it the other way where there's too much clipping happening. And then you would get hyperphantasia or often schizophrenia because the hmm. brain is too interlinked. That is wild. Are you serious? And yeah, I have this like, you know, 18, 19 year old kid explaining all this to me. And I'm like, man, like, this is so fascinating. Like, thank you so much. And I was like, see, that's why you should go ahead and not be ashamed and ask your question. Because you just explained some stuff to me that is really illuminating for me. And um, also linking, I guess, the these, uh, these mTOR processes, they they're connected to the autism spectrum, which I'm convinced that I right. would have been, you know, as a young kid, I would have been put on that. And within the autism spectrum, you get, you get it going either way. You either get the functional autistics and those tend to be the people who have the, the dense local neurons. Right. And they tend to come with aphantasia as well, or you get the non-functional and they tend to be more on the learning disability side and at risk for uh, schizophrenia. That is wild. The idea that high functioning visual 
visualization might be linked to schizophrenia is a very intriguing concept that I don't want to go too far into right now. You're like, I'm <laughs> a little a, worried about that. It's very, very interesting. Well, I mean, it makes sense, though, because basically what you're creating is you're creating a uh, you're creating a total brain synesthete, right, where all the senses right. are mixed up. Anyways, way off topic from this, but uh, talking I, talking about the uh, the phantasms and stuff like it yeah. could be. And he was talking well, about they're looking at processes to regulate these now. I I doubt that I've talked about any but uh, with this more than you know two or three times to anyone. But uh, I had uh, symptoms of uh, what would have been considered schizophrenia um, when I was a late teenager. Um, and uh, they didn't appear after that. Hmm. Uh, I had them for a brief period of a couple months. And uh, I thought at the time that I was crazy um, or that I was going crazy. And uh, they, didn't, they didn't come back. Um, but um, I've always been intrigued by the condition and uh, also intrigued by the, medical con the medicalization of it uh, in our particular society. And the idea that there are outlets for it in other 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 societies or other possibilities, you know. We're you talking about like shamanism or mm -hmm. that kind of thing. Yeah. yeah. And and really like looking at it as in the light of someone who has a more highly connected brain. Right. Uh, you know, like that that there's just more overlap between the different areas is is a yeah, I found that particularly, really particularly interesting. Um, yeah, you told me at some point, you did say on the channel that you don't consider yourself a good candidate for psychedelics. Right. <laughs> and that yeah, would be and, and a good reason. That, that, was, that was the chief reason uh, given by the person who told me that. Um, because I had had uh, visual and auditory hallucinations uh, when I was a teenager. Uh, when I was very depressed, and uh, I think that those are not unrelated to each other. Well, it, it's, I mean, so with what he was explaining, there may have been something that caused, like, okay, now you're dendrite, you're the mTOR process that I don't, you know, again, you know, I, I just had this explained to me, I haven't researched on my own, but I think it's a protein. There are things that you can do to get that protein process going again and clipping in the way it should be mm. um, or if it's not clipping you can get it to start clipping and he was very hopeful about it as like because he's very distressed about as i am a little bit about not being able to see things in my head like it's very frustrating right. as an artist to not imagine things um so it sounded hopeful that you could actually you know those those connections aren't dead they're just kind of clogged mm-hmm uh, so I don't know. That was all really interesting. Uh, okay, yeah, we this is going good for both of us, huh? Yeah, I think so. We're both like leaning into the looseness. Mm -hmm. I really enjoy the brushwork. This type of shapes that he's got are so like in the tail here. That's just so much fun for me. I'm almost sad to go back to the pen now. Uh, I, I've been satisfied. My my, my brush was uh, acting up. I need to go back to um, I need to go back to a true sable brush instead of the synthetic sable I've been using. I'm just not satisfied with them right now. It's not the um, series seven number two. Right. I can't. I can't. I don't know if I can afford that or if I could justify that. But uh, I I was using a uh, another sable that I'm reasonably happy with. But uh, my sable died. So wow. I, I tried out a synthetic sable and it just just doesn't feel as good. I'm pretty. I've got that tool, you know. Uh, I have so many of them because it's strange to. Uh, right. But I would have a hard time using anything else. It's like there's something about it. I tried to switch over for a while because they're they really have declined in quality. You'll get a good one, but it seems to me like there's a decline in quality overall. So I tried something that I've seen other people using on Instagram. I, I don't know the number, but it's a Raphael. And yeah. um, 
it looked good, but I, maybe I just got a bum one of those. I don't know. I was really unhappy using that brush. Well, my pre-COVID recommendation for brushes is to make sure that you can test them out at the store so you don't get a bum one. But uh, obviously, not everybody's living in a location right now that that's uh, feasible. Well, and I just ordered one off the internet, you know. It's just, I didn't have, I didn't have a store where they would have had a brush like that anyways. I am confused good. about the directionality of some of his lines. Like which way his hand was turned or whatever. Or if he's turning the paper, I don't know. I really like the guidelines that he's put in for some of the hatching. Like on the head here? Mm-hmm. Yeah. It strikes me as like almost like lithography. I think he came back in and did any of those later. No, I think that he did the guidelines first and then used them as a visual guide when he's putting in the hatching. I just wonder if there's like, there's certain, like, cause there was one that I just put in that like when I was hatching, it was like, oh, okay, I need one there now. Right. Yeah, maybe. I, do, I agree that most of them are there in place while he's, he's like feeling his way through the image. Right. Like he's 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 kind of marking off the planes, which is something I'll do when I paint or whatever. I want to I want to mark a plane shift, and so I'll put a contour line there to show, like the edge of the plane. And I think that's what he's doing, just mentally making a note of the plane shift and letting that be part of the image in the end, which is cool. I just there's. A I wonder lot if he's things where, Sorry, go ahead. I wonder if he's ever had his stuff inked by somebody else. I can't imagine what this would look like. Who would you put over top of him? Sam Keith. <laughs> oh shit, that would be that would be pretty wild. The patterning would just go like totally off the rails. I would do like Klaus Jansen or somebody that's <laughs> you know kind of equally chunky and right what were you saying i don't know oh no uh, i was gonna say that he really seems to draw in a lot of different directions too he's not always like flicking up or down or moving left or no. right like i'm seeing things that are tapered in ways that indicate a lot of different movements of the pen so i'm wondering if he's turning the page but it doesn't seem like it well i think your your observation that he's using a non-sharp nib and has a lot of angle adjustment is probably the answer to that yeah but it's not just that it's like sometimes the lines are going this way and sometimes they're going like that way like he's flicking this way and then flicking this way at what to me seems like fairly arbitrary. Like this one, he's obviously flicking down. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Like the direction of, cause I don't think he's just really varying his pressure a lot, but it's, I feel like he's going down there and then up there and Topi does this too, down there. Like he's switching his hand. And like what the decision making process on that is, even if it's instinctive, like why all of a sudden is your hand going like this way and then you're switching it to this way? Mm -hmm. This is definitely inspirational for me, although I'm not, it's not resolving for me. Once again, I'm looking at it and it's not coming together. Huh. I wonder if it's just a confidence thing. This is what happens if I spend a couple of weeks not drawing and working on you know, publishing stuff. And then I like publishing tasks, you know, I feel like yeah. I kind of have infinite tasks at the moment. Um, and then I come back to the drawing stuff, expecting to have my skills like a hundred percent, you know? Yeah. The resolving thing is I, maybe I'm a little too like 
prone to get caught up in the weeds too so it's like i don't know i look uh, once all the marks are there then i'll look at it from this especially when you're sitting down like this and it's already right. for this especially it's already there so he's kind of made all those resolve choices right. not too terribly that's why inking is like, or, or recreating stuff is so much fun is there's really nothing to do but just mindlessly play let's see like right now when i'm looking at this image and i'm thinking i need to finish this image what i'm actually thinking is where do i need to shore up like with a thicker line to contain some of the movement um and it doesn't look done to me because i don't have a thick enough line underneath the chin this is like getting lost for me and it's funny he's already made the decision you would think that my brain would stop you know to not put yeah he's made a decision to not have a very thin right huh. there's something really weird going on up here where he's got like marks like that in the middle oh yeah the of... little i love those the scale things yeah they look but like little they're scales. in the middle of what look like continuous lines yep i think he so... put those in first and then he did the side hatching around them yeah, but it looks like he hatched over top of them, which is crazy because the line weight changes kind of flow, which makes me think he might be drawing a little bit slower than we think because that's a pretty controlled move to make. Mm -hmm. Well, and then he's got like a faux line on the other side of the head where it's all diagonal hatching lines, but it looks like a line if you're just glancing at it. Yeah. Like this right here. Mm hmm. That's definitely a controlled move. That's not a flashy or flash, you know, fast freewheeling move. Yeah. And again, it's a really smart move because it takes what could be a flat thing and it gives it like top and then moving down the side. Yep. And uh, it also gives it a, a secondary light source, what's called a rim light. Yeah. Because the implication is that the there's a rim of light on the edge of the head there. I'd say what's so much easier upside down. Man, I should have done the whole thing upside down, but then I wouldn't be thinking like him. I, I can do his marks upside down. I'm just incapable of getting the spirit of it right side up. Just because of the right to left hand. Yeah, the hand thing. Do you tend to work? Because uh, I just had a, a student. I was watching her draw the other day, and she was she's left-handed, and she was still drawing left to right, and so her hand was like covering up the image as it as right. she went, and she was very like distressed about it. And I said, and I said, well, you can't see what you're drawing. Right. Like you're, you you're used to going you're used to going left to right because your teacher you know because you have to write that way but like when you draw like you can go the other way so you can see what you're doing was that something you had to really consciously train yourself to do while you were drawing or is it instinctive or do you cover up i don't remember um i definitely do not draw left to right um and when i have to for like comics compositional purposes i just basically am treating each panel as its own unit um yeah i don't know i, I don't recall ever having that as a struggle but that's an interesting idea because you're right you you learn how to do that by necessity writing in the english language yeah, yeah so see, i look. always have a clear view of like all this stuff is done right and she was like covering up what she did so she was making a shape but covering it up as she went like when you did this did you ink it you kind of started on the left like i did right we we've pretty much taken the same path yeah the image. because that's that's where the head i i did the his head because that seemed like the, the focus okay i have something i never thought about before i mean i i've because of you talking about the the tapering now i'm thinking about that but i've never watched someone actively like cover up what they were doing until the other day so all our lefties tell us 
like pay attention how has the american education system made it harder for you to draw because <laughs> you're constantly covering yourself up it sucks and was, man and was there a point at which you actively like learned to work the other way for the sake of your art you know what i'm gonna do, do next time we do one of these carson what's that i'm gonna mirror reverse it oh that I'm makes sense printed. printed out reverse That's interesting. And so, yes, some of these hatching lines are just using the side of the pen. Because they're more straight. Uh huh. And thicker. All right, I'm finally getting satisfied. And it's because I got just a few of those more characteristic marks in. Now I'm getting more satisfied with it. Needed a little bit more of that sort of random. Uh, not really random, but the tool responsive transformation. How about these, like uh, these butterfly marks, like this? I've always had a trouble with those. Yeah, those are interesting. Those are very characteristic to him. Like I was saying, usually frowned upon in illustration textbooks and such because they draw a lot of attention to themselves as compared to. Uh, pure parallel hatching but a lot of the people that i really respect do them alex raymond does them in spots not a lot mm -hmm. stan drake does it all the time right um it's that like just that you're just drawing and it has that freshness to it yeah normally you would say don't do it because it ruins the sense of contour but people pull it off very well and simonson's definitely one of them it's just very hard for me to do because they have a they get so good at the pressure of like thick thin thick thin and i've never been good i think that might come from drawing more sideways too because mm -hmm. then the pin the pin creates that sinkevich does that kind of stuff too i'm taking a few more liberties with it now uh, so that i can be satisfied I think I might be approaching a completion here. Yeah, me too. I finally drew at your speed. <laughs> Thank you, Simonson. Yeah, man. I I, uh, I really love his stuff. It's a real treat to get to pretend to be him for a little bit. Now you're going to be all like, God, I just want to go draw, but I got to get back to <laughs> photo adjusting no. some knucklehead stupid blue printer. <laughs> <laughs> no, the next thing I'm going to do as soon as we get off this, this call is I'm going to draw some more. Oh, my um, God. Good. So I, I get to maintain this. Unfortunately, I'm penciling. Uh, but, no, that is an unfortunate follow up because now you're all in the flow. Exactly. All right, well, that was fun. Yeah, and I think I think a lot of it is more holding the hand sideways because a lot yep. of the curves are better done that way, right? Than that way. All right, that was fun. Again, thank you so much to our patrons for for choosing Simonson and then choosing this particular Simonson project because I think this is like out of all the ones like the one that is definitely just kind of the texture and stuff is the one that i was like oh my god i would really, really have fun with that yeah it was a blast and uh thank you very much if you are interested in being a patron uh there is a link there and you can you know tell us what to do you can <laughs> ask us questions tell us uh, we finally do. got our tech series up off the ground we have a couple installments of that up right now and we're doing these things because we think people are enjoying them, but, um, you know, if you want to encourage us to do them more, please give us some cash. Yeah, uh, we do. We do very much appreciate that. And, um, yeah, you guys are making it happen. And have a say in who we ink next for sure. Well, I'm, I'm going to try and make this like um, every month and a half or something seems like about when we can get one of these squoves in, in between all of the, the interviews that we're lining up and that kind of stuff. Uh, so look at that patron. eric larson hand there carson yeah that is a super eric larson hand 
All right, yeah. Larson. We know who you're cribbing now. <laughs> that it's that finish, big that... spread between those two fingers right there. Right. That's the Larson thing. Yeah. It's fantastic. All, All the right. joints accounted for. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks so much, Sean. Okay, yeah, uh, have, a pleasure, have man. Fun, uh, have fun getting to your penciling. I'm sorry you can't ink right now. Oh, it's okay. I'll, I will be able to soon. So if I uh, <laughs> right. tear through this. All right. Take care, man. Later, everybody.